Good morning, everyone. Good, morning. Good to have you all here today. Let's, uh, let's all stand, and we're going to open our service in prayer. Those that are online, we're so glad you're with us today as well. Thank you for joining us. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we're so grateful for another day that you've given us. Uh, again, a, a, a day that we've not deserved. Your mercies are new each morning, and Lord, we're so appreciative of this day, and we pray that we would worship you today, that our worship would be effective, that it would be pleasing in your sight. Uh, that you would indeed be worshipped, that our attention would be drawn away from ourselves, that it would be drawn away from the world that we live in, the activities of the day. Um, And Lord, I pray that our, our full attention would be on your person so that we would focus on who you are and therefore our songs, our attention to your word, our prayers, uh, our, even our interaction with one another would all be considered uh, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. And we commit this day to you. And we ask for your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And please remain standing. Okay, we're going to begin by turning to number nine. 
And before we actually start singing, I want to uh, us to take a look at the words here and notice some different things about this hymn. So, uh, number nine, Come Thou Almighty King. And the first verse is dealing with praise to God the Father. You can see, Father all glorious, over all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. And then the second is dealing with praise to Jesus, the incarnate word. The third is to the Holy Spirit, Holy Comforter. And then the last is praise to the triune God. Amen. And so each verse deals with a different person of the Trinity, and the last brings it all together. So Amen. let's sing in praise to our triune God. Come thou almighty King, Help us thy name to sing, Help us to praise, Father all glorious, or all victorious, Come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, good on thy mighty sword. Our prayer attend, come and thy people bless, and give thy word success. Spirit of holiness on us descend. Come, holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear. In this glad hour, thou who almighty art, now rule in every heart, and ne'er from us depart, Spirit of power. To thee, great one in three, eternal praises be, and severmore, thy sovereign majesty may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. You may be seated. I have a few announcements here this morning. One is that in coming up June 28th is our 30th year anniversary. And so we're looking at putting together uh, an album, pictures uh, of church activities or people from the past 30 years. How many of you have pictures from the past 30 years? I think probably quite a few of you do. So uh, let's dig back into the archives and bring them to church. And it'll be fun looking back and sharing about the memories from the past. Uh, we are anticipating a special baptism service for next Sunday. So if you would like to be baptized that day, uh, please speak with Pastor. And we are looking for more people to take on the ministry of providing transportation uh, for two ladies to and from church on Sundays. Uh, the more the merrier. Um, or the more we have, then the more that it lightens the load for everybody. So uh, let's bow for a word of prayer as uh, we receive the offering this morning. Father, thank you for your loving care for us, for your mighty power. Lord, you are good, and you do good. And Lord, help us to praise you and honor you and glorify you as you are worthy to be praised and honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Thank you, Josh. Amen. Please take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for our scripture reading. Good to have you here today, and hopefully I'm, we have some good, good people. We have some good people, probably have some bad people online as well. We got some good people and bad people here, don't we? Actually, we got all bad people, don't we? All have sinned and come short. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word. I'm going to begin reading in verse 13. And um, probably end around verse 27. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, after we're done reading, please remain standing in prayer. Beginning in verse 13. The Bible says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now, God is... Hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him? And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again, the hand to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable... Upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. May God bless his word. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we come before you knowing that if anything is going to happen today here of value, then it will have to be of eternal value. And it will have to be the work, your work, where you have used your word. And Father, I pray that you would give me liberty as I preach, but most importantly that in that liberty it would be clearly the Spirit of God using the word of God rightly interpreted and rightly expounded to challenge the people of God. And I pray, Father, for those that are lost, that the Spirit of God would illuminate hearts and minds to spiritual conditions, the folks that are Uh, lost, would get saved. And Father, we ask your blessing for the church that you would help us to understand what you are doing today in this thing called the church that you are building. And we're so grateful that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We ask your blessing today. Help us, Father, to apply what we learn. Help us to benefit and help us to be stronger. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And you may be seated. So please turn to number 279, His Robes for Mine. And this is one of the newer hymns that is included in uh, the Rejoice hymnal that was not in our old hymnal. And uh, just pay attention to to the words as we go through it. You know, all hymns, all music was new at one point. And this is, uh, again, a rich hymn that has been more recently uh, uh, written and something that I believe will bless us as we sing to the Lord and to one another. Number 279, 279, His Robes for Mine.
his robes for mine, O wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? God's daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand, with righteous works not mine. Saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Second, God estranged from God, but by such love my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, God's justice is appeased. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father's pleased. Christ drank God's wrath on sin, then cried, "'Tis done. Sin's wage is paid, propitiation won. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, such anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved, condemned as though his foe. He as the I, accursed and left alone. I as though he, embraced and welcomed home. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. That was an interesting point that Jason brought out about come thou almighty king. How many times have I sang that? And I never even realized it was addressing each person of the Trinity and then the Trinity at the end. And then, uh, you know, this new song, there's a lot of good doctrine in this. I, I, probably if Jason didn't say that, I would have just sang it blankly, mindlessly, you know. But I mean, I, I'm thinking of it and like, look at the, in the chorus. I know you don't have your hymn books open, but... Uh, I cling to Christ and marvel at the cross. 
And this phrase, Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. You know, the whole idea that God the Father could turn his back on God the Son is such a mind-boggling thing. And I don't know if I've ever heard it put that way in a, in a song so effectively. I mean, that's good. And then, you know, I'm picking up all these things. Thanks, Jason. Um, in that last verse, um, he as though I accursed and left alone. I as though he embraced and welcomed home. That's uh, the whole idea of imputation. I mean, that's just good stuff. Excellent. We sing good hymns here. I appreciate that. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, uh, Sunday mornings for a while, our, our, our loose theme is still people. Uh, and, and so we're taking different tangents with this. So today and next Sunday... Uh, we're going to be looking at First. We've actually already looked at First Corinthians chapter twelve in my previous messages. Uh, I think there was a two-parter, and now I forget what it was called, and it really doesn't matter because we're moving on. But uh, this one is is going to be based upon a phrase that really led me to this text in the first place, and it is kind of a guiding thought in my mind as far as what our job is which seems sometimes to be an impossible task. Um, and, and so we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, really verses 12 through verse 28. And I want to back up for a minute and just set the scene. The title of the message today is based on the phrase that the members may have the same care one for another. And so that phrase, same care. Equal care. Oh, we're all about that today, aren't we? Equal rights. Equal this, equal that. Equal care. The same care, one for another. What does he mean by that? And so we're going to look at this text. So today is uh, equal care, part one. And then next Sunday is equal, equal care, part two. And uh, so back up for a minute. Kind of connects with what we're talking about in Sunday school. You know, when it comes to dispensing goodies everybody's ready to get in line, aren't they? And uh, in fact, everyone has an opinion on how those goodies should be dispensed when it comes to receiving the goodies. Because we all want goodies. And, but when it comes to their own goodies, you know, giving them away, uh, we don't want other people telling us how to dispense our goodies. And by goodies, I mean, we could be talking about time, Energy, money, property, attention, affection. All these things are things that we have to give to other people. And so when it comes to, and here's what we're talking about. Paul is addressing ministry. And he's talking about really investing in other people. Uh, people within the body of Christ. Uh, who gets, you know, who... Who do we give this attention to? Who, you know, the idea of dispensing our time and our energy. That's what ministry is. It's care. It's caring for people. Caring for souls. And Paul says, in this, whatever he's talking about, he says that the members, that's you guys, that's me, that the members should have the same care one for another. And an effective church... That's going to play out. But what does that mean? The same care one for another? Is this, is this um, like socialism of attention? You know, that, you know, what, what was the, uh, what was that phrase that, um, oh, I even had it, and I think I left it at home. From each according to his ability, to each, somebody finish that for me, according to his need. Not a guy that we like quoting too much, right? Karl Marx. Uh, but actually, you know, the more I thought about that quote, uh, the more I thought, you know, that's kind of like what Paul's talking about. And we're going to see that. In fact, we see the word equality mentioned in the scriptures in one of the texts we're going to share this morning when it comes to what we're supposed to be doing. We could look at the first century church, Acts 2, 3, and 4, where 
they, in fact, people have used the scriptures in that example there in, in the book of Acts to try to promote communism, socialism, and Marxism. And on the surface, it may seem to be promoting that, but it is not. What it's really teaching us, though, it is teaching us how you and I can have the right mentality, because that's what he's talking about, when it comes to viewing other people, brothers and sisters in Christ, one another. You know, if you and I don't think right about each other, we're going to have problems. And that's usually where problems start in the church, when somebody doesn't have the right attitude about someone else. If you and I don't think properly about other people, if we don't care about other people, if, if, we, if we make it all about ourselves, the church is going to have major problems. And churches have split because people have gotten their eyes off of ministry and off of Christ and stopped caring genuinely about other people. And so we're going to talk today about this idea of the same care. Let me give you the outline and then we'll jump in prayer. We're going to look at three things and the text is going to guide us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, really loosely it's going to go from verses 12 through verse 28. But here we, Paul talks about the body of Christ, which is the church, and he uses the illustration of a human body. And he makes some very simple, matter of fact, hey, here's something about the human body. And then he says, now look, this correlates to the church. So we're going to see, first of all, the assessment of the body. That is what our view is, because that's his first challenge. You know, the, the, the idea of the ears, the eyes, and he actually makes them speak. You know, if the, if the eye could think this way and it said this about the ears, uh, and, and of course it's kind of a ridiculous scenario, because I've never had my eyes and my ears revolt against me and say, hey, get rid of those eyes, or, you know, anything like that. But it's a picture, because... I have had that happen in the church where the eyes will say to the ears or something like that, you know, get rid of this person or, the, you know, that kind of an idea. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, our assessment of the body, point, and that's verses 15 through 17 and then verse 21. And then we see the authority of the body. Who made the church the way he did? Who made the human body the way he did? And it was both of, both of them were made by design with purpose. And then thirdly, activity within the body. Who does what? What should our mentality be? How should we view one another? How should we view ourselves? Let's bow in prayer and then we'll jump in. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for those that are joining us online. We thank you for those that are traveling and that are away, that are joining us online. Thank you that live away, that used to be part of us, that are joining us online. And thank you for everyone here. Father, help us to give our full attention to your word. Speak to our hearts, and uh, Father, I pray that you would bless us for your honor and your glory, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So, here's the context. Let me back up for a minute, because Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he is addressing a church that is going through some real conflict. There's division within the church. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, here's what Paul says, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared to, unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now contentions within a church body can destroy that body. And um, an, an unhealthy church has a lot of contention inside of it and a lot of wrong thinking. A healthy church doesn't have a lot of contention. And this church was not a healthy church. And he, he talks about that. They, he, he said you need to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. There's this word, the same mind, same judgment, same care. We're talking about equality. And, and we have so much to learn. In fact, I submit to you that the text we're looking at today and then next week is the perfect 
refutation of Marxism, socialism, and communism. And yet it's often used to promote those. And it's actually one of the greatest refutations against it. Because Paul is not saying, all right, we need to level the playing field so that all things are equal. In fact, the very illustration of the human body is that it's not all equal. We're not all one big eye. We're not all, you know, a big hand walking into church. We're, we're made up of different members, our body. Would you want it any other way? Anybody? You know, I, I like the two hands I have. I like the two legs I have. I'm glad I only have one head because if I had two heads, it would create some problems. You know, God made us perfectly. And folks, here's the point. He's made the church the way he wants it. And it's not the way a lot of us or a lot of people think it should operate. Because sometimes the head has a problem with, or sometimes the hands have a problem with the ear. Or the ear has a problem with the leg. And God has uniquely put us together. And Paul is addressing that. In fact, he starts out. Let me get my Bible open. My Bible is not open and I'm preaching. That is horrible. I should be fired. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. He says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And then he brings out some of the major divisions of that day. I mean, these are things that people were emotionally charged in. Whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. And then he goes on into this illustration. So, the challenge now. Paul's using the human body. And first he addresses, let's just jump right in, the assessment of the body. You know, which he's using this to get to the, the root of the problem at Corinth. And it was their view of one another. This was, remember, there were divisions. And it was their mentality. It was the way they were thinking. So Paul is addressing that. And he starts off in verse 15 through, seven, through 17. In fact, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. If the foot shall say, in fact, verse 14, for the body is not one member, but, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not of the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? What's the answer? Of course not. You know? If a foot says, I'm not the hand, so I'm not part of the body, it doesn't matter what the foot says, it's part of the body. Verse 16, if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? What a ridiculous line of argument. What's he talking about? The foot saying, oh, I'm not part of the body. and He's about to relate it to the church, folks. Because of people weren't thinking right. So again, if ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? No, of course, it's still of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? And then uh, we jump down to verse 21. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again, the head to the foot, feet, I have no need of you. So he addresses two perspectives. First of all, uh, he in verses uh, 12 through 17, he, he addresses those people who think they're not important to the church or the body, you know, uh, the foot. The foot says, you know, and imagine what he's... Lay through this ridiculous scenario because he's communicating a point. Imagine if your foot one day started getting jealous of your hand. I mean, you cover your foot. What an insult. Beautiful foot that you have. Feet, should I say. You got beautiful feet, your feet are saying. And you cover me up every day. In fact, this is Paul's point here in this argument. He's talking about clothing and how we cover some parts. We've looked at that already. But So your foot is like... I'm not really appreciated here. I'm covered up every day. Look at the hand. just gets to be free. Everybody's looking at their hands. Nobody stops and, and appreciates me. You get the point. Because he's talking about us. He's talking about how you might feel that you're not important. And that has led many of God's people to check out. 
on this thing called church. You know, everybody, this person gets so much attention, nobody pays attention to me, I'm just not going anymore. You know, or I, I, you know th- that idea. By the way, you and I have to be very careful. The Bible says, and Paul even tells the Corinthians, you, we, we've got to stop comparing ourselves to one another. And that's what the, the body's doing, right? He said, we dare not make ourselves of the number. Or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. Paul says, they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. We do that too. It's a human tendency. We tend to compare ourselves with others, especially when somebody's getting praised or attention is given to some person. We think, oh, why am I never mentioned? You know? Uh, or if we're getting picked on, somebody's saying something negative. We say, well, wow, man, why don't they pick on, why are they always condemning me? You know, the, the danger is to put ourselves in the number. And then the next group is, the first one again is thinking we're not important. The next one is the kind of the flip side. It's when we look at other people and think they're not important. Oh, I'm much better than that person. That's verse 21. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Now remember, folks, he's talking to a group of people that were starkly divided before they came to Christ. Their entire backgrounds were different. Jew, Gentile. And in fact, these backgrounds, by being a Jew, by being a Gentile, had automatically created Uh, an an environment of animosity that had to be addressed, and it affected the church. Uh, You know, some of the problems when you look through the book of Acts had to do between the Greeks and the the Hebrews and the Greeks, you know, that there there was this this conflict. And in Christ, this issue had to be addressed. And I appreciate we're in our Sunday morning service, or no, Sunday Bible study hour. We're going to finish next week. And then the week after that, Charlie should be back dealing with... um, the Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount. But uh, we are dealing with social justice, controversial, uh, a book by Vody Bauckham. And uh, in one of his chapters, called, uh, his book is called Fault Lines. And one of his chapters, the subtitle or the subheading is uh, about being a- an Afrocentric Christian. In fact, he, he shares his own story. And on page 26, he says, at one point in his life, he said, at that point in my life, I was most certainly more black than Christian. Listen to what he says. Now it's on page 21. He says, There is a major discussion among black evangelicals as to whether in discussing or applying our faith in the midst of the current cultural crisis, the priority should be on our blackness or on our Christianity. In other words, are we Christians or black people first? This may seem strange to non-black Christians. However, I assure you it is a real issue. And it is, a relevant, it is relevant to the topic of this book. He says, I have wrestled with this question since coming to faith, and I have fallen on both sides of it at different times. The question of the proper order of faith and ethnicity is critical to understanding the various positions people take in the broader social justice debate, one with which people must wrestle regardless of their ethnicity. However, for black Christians, this concept has often been difficult to embrace for several reasons. Listen Listen to why black people would struggle with this. He said the question, or no, he goes, black nationalists have often argued that Christianity is the white man's religion and that whites used it to encourage slaves to be docile. My childhood hero, Malcolm X, for example, quote-unquote, he's quoting Malcolm X, denounced Christianity as a religion designed for slaves. He also saw, quoting Malcolm X, quote-unquote, the Negro clergy as the curse of the black man, exploiting, exploiting him for their purposes instead of seeking to liberate him, and acting as handmaidens of the white community in its determination to keep the Negroes in a subservient position, unquote. He says this is very similar to Marx's insistence that, quote-unquote, religion is the opiate of the masses. 
So when black nationalism is combined with Marxism, and it often is, an especially virulent strain of anti-Christian sentiment forms. Therefore, for many black people, coming to faith in Christ requires addressing this objection not only in and for one's own self, but also for one's peers. And then later on in in this page, or this book, this chapter, he makes this statement. The gospel is not something that merely sits on top of our identity. When we come to Christ, our identity is transformed completely. I want to give you an example that we've looked at uh, a couple times during our Bible study, maybe even in the morning service. And it has to do with what Paul and Peter and John found themselves in that first century when they were writing to Christians, when they were writing their epistles, and the makeup of people then. You had the Roman, it was a Roman rule. And you had... Uh, when you study church, or when you study history, not church history, when you study history and the Ro- Roman province and all that, you, you learn that Rome went out and, and conquered nations and brought everyone under this banner during this, where we would find the first century church. And they had something that the Romans were very proud of called Pax Romana, which literally is Roman peace. And they were real big on that. Now, Pax Romana was not a, you know, Jesus saying, my peace I give you, my, you know, my peace I... No, this was a peace that was a, a militarily enforced peace. So these other nations are, are, you know, conquered. They're all brought under one empire of Rome. And they are all, by force, put in a situation where they have to get along or suffer the consequences physically. And then all of a sudden now, Jesus comes along. The gospel, he dies, buries, risen again. The gospel is now, the church starts. And now people are getting saved in that setting. So you've got Jew and Gentile. You've got barbarian, Scythian, bond or free. Let's talk about the barbarian and the Scythian. Who are they? Well, they're, they're people that were a certain ethnicity, uh, it, it's their heritage. Now, especially the Scythians. Arche- uh, archaeology has uncovered that it is very likely that, s- that some of the Scythians were part of, they were like mercenaries that were involved in Babylon's invasion of Israel and conquering Jerusalem, and that a lot of the, the Scythians, because they, they were a very violent people, very brutal, very fierce. And they were involved when, when Babylon conquered and, and just, you know, went in and destroyed Rome and con- or conquered Israel, that the Scythians were mercenaries. They were very ruthless people. When you study their history and you read and, um, a lot of Jewish history, like Josephus, even the Apocrypha, the book of Maccabees, by the way, which uh, is history, it's Just we don't accept it as given by inspiration of God. There's history there. Um, Early church fathers, uh, they all attest to the fact that the Scythians were barbaric people. In fact, the example of the Scythians getting saved and becoming unsavaged by Christ uh, was something that motivated the five missionaries in Ecuador. Remember Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, those guys? They were inspired by, and their goal for these brutal tribes in Ecuador was to see them saved and become one in Christ, just like the Scythians. Now here's what's interesting. When Paul addressed, in fact, um, look at, uh, in, turn to Colossians 3. We've got a minute or two. Paul is writing to the church who's made up of all kinds of people. And he's about ready to review one of the Ten Commandments on how they treat one another. And you're not going to treat someone you don't respect properly if you don't have the right attitude about them. If you think someone is below you or unworthy of showing, of showing honor, you're not going to show them honor. So when it comes to the 
Ninth commandment. Paul says, lie not one to another. Colossians 3 verse 9. Seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So he's saying, okay, now whatever, forget about whatever your backgrounds were. This goes along with Vodi's point that, you know, when, in fact, he said, when we come to Christ, the gospel is not something that merely sits on top of our identity. When we come to Christ, our identity is transformed completely. So the barbarian and the Scythian, notice Paul when he writes to them, he doesn't say, okay, Scythians, we got some past to address. We got to go back and we got to make remunerations for the, the way your ancestors treated the Jews and other nations. We, you're going to have to make reparations. You're going to have to go back and, and it's going to take at least 20 years for you to pay back. So, because he doesn't even do that. He would do that. If we listen to a lot of preachers today that are talking about, you know, racial reparations of past slavery and all this, folks, this is not a message that is founded in Scripture. We're not saying any, any slavery of the past was right. But I want you to notice here that in Christ, again, as Vodi said, you know, our identity in Christ is transformed and Paul never did that. When, he, when he's ministering to these people, he says, I don't care what your great-great-great-grandfather did, you don't lie to that brother. And I don't care what his great-great-grandfather did, you don't lie to that person. Because you're one in Christ. For the most part, folks, I think we have that here. I am very blessed by the lack of favoritism that people show because of the different backgrounds because we love one another we respect one another we don't view anyone you know like the hand in the eye we're not we don't say well you know what those that group of people is better than me or i am better than that group of people we don't have that in fact that's what paul's trying to get to these corinthians He's trying to get in their mind. That's why when he would say that the members would have the same care one for another. The idea of the same care, that word, in fact, he says it, let's just go because time is quickly, somebody, the door is closed. I don't know why time's slipping away so quickly. But let's look at, um, let's look at that statement. We'll pick up with this again next week. But that, he says, um, Verse 24, for our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. See that word care? That is the same, exact same Greek word that is translated, uh, take no thought for your life. You know, in, in, uh, when Jesus, in Matthew, he said, don't worry, take no thought for your life. The word care has to do with attention, anxiety, worry, care. And he's saying, we need to have the same perspective of one another. We need to esteem one another so that we care about everyone equally. Not that, this is not saying, again, socialism of affection. I know... I remember I shared this that uh, when I was a student pastor at Bible Baptist in Westchester, there were two student pastors, myself and uh, a man named Mike Tardivi, that we would we would do hospital visits. And I still remember to this day how disappointed people would be when maybe a hospital staff would say, oh, a church pastor is here. And they're expecting the pastor. And in come these two green behind the ears, young punks in suits. And they're like, I, I just, you could, you know, it's so obvious. I want Pastor Griffith here. 
what are you doing here? You know, and, and talk about feeling like a second class citizen, you know. But I have come to realize that while it is a blessing to want to be want for people to want to have your attention and personal ministry, it also can be an anchor. I've had people over the years that have this almost socialistic attitude about, in fact, I remember a family, and this is not the same connection, but I remember a family where the husband and wife, um, I love this couple, and they, uh, they had this thing where they, uh, I think she made it up where she would say, he gets, she gets. If her husband got something, then she would use the, okay, he gets, she gets, you know. And she got, she got some mileage from that, you know. All right, he gets, she gets. And, and, you know, that obviously, that's the way many Americans are today. Hey, I, you know, we want, equal, we want equal pay. We want equal distribution. We want all things being equal. And, and folks, that is not the way the body is designed. And so there have been times when I would make a hospital visit to someone that was in the hospital. And people would, they would then judge, okay, he visited Mrs. Smith, who only had, I'm trying to think of like a minor surgery, um, and app. Well, that's pretty mi- major, isn't it? Give me a m- more minor surgery. A mole, removed. a mole removed. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so they think. Okay, Pastor Lyon visited Mrs. Smith. She had a mole removed, and I broke my leg. So he is definitely going to come see me in the hospital. And she doesn't realize that my visiting on who I visit has nothing to do with the severity. Usually, I mean. There have been times when I have not visited when I wanted to and I was not able to. Because I'm only one person, it just totally had to do with my schedule. And so there has definitely not been an equal distribution or any kind of consistent standard on when I'm going to visit you in the hospital. Now, if it's very serious, I will try to drop what I'm doing. I really will. And and I think most of you know that. But sometimes I'll visit you for... Minor things. Now, of course, COVID has changed everything. You understand that, right? Um, But these expectations is not what Paul's talking about when he says the same care one for another. He's talking about our mentality in how we view everyone is necessary. And everybody has to be given the same amount of credit, credibility. Let me give you another example that came to my mind. Um, It has been a blessing. (coughs) Civil War is never a blessing. And um, I had uh, two great grand uncles that fought in the Civil War. But I'm not talking about our Civil War. I'm talking about Liberia's Civil War. Because they had a Civil War. And that ended up sending a lot of people to America. And that ended up benefiting our church. It's got a whole lot of Liberians in our church. And folks, we got different people. We were brought up differently. We are, we, we get, we are intermingled with people that grew up while we were growing up. They grew up halfway across this world. And so they grew up differently. Same with our Ethiopians and Koreans and so forth. But we have a lot of Liberians. And they didn't grow up the way that we did. We grew up, I'll tell you, my mom made sure that whenever I got a present, Stevie, don't you ever call me that. <laughs> Stevie, did you write your thank you notes? Oh, the, the dreaded thank you notes. Oh, no, mom. And we make, our, we make our kids do it. And it's just, I see the same blood, sweat, and tears coming out of them, you know? <laughs> did you write your thank you notes? No. See, we... Our parents made a big deal about that. In America, we make a big deal about that. Now, and I appreciate my Ajwa. She shared with us one time that, and, and then it's been confirmed by multitudes of Liberians, that's not a big, that's not even a thing in Liberia. They just communicate their gratitude. That's how they do it. Now, let me ask you something. There may be some of our Liberians that feel led, like, you know what, 
All right, this is an American custom, and I want to show them some respect, so I'll write the thank you notes. But let me ask you something, Americans. What if you don't get a thank you note from our Liberians? You're going to be offended? Well, now, wait a minute. They, they have different ways of expressing the gratitude and so a lack of a thank you note is not in their perspective in any way meant to be that I'm not grateful. They just express it differently. Are you willing to accept that? You love these people? I, honestly, when I heard Adjua say that, immediately every Liberian for the rest of my life gets a pass on ever writing me a thank you note. Really, you don't need to. I will not only will I not be offended, I'm not now even expecting it. Honestly. Because this, I don't see any verse that says, thou shalt write a thank you note one to another. By the way, Josh was shaking his head. So, Josh, don't use this. Go, don't go home and tell your mom. Pastor said we don't have to write thank you notes. I'm going to get in trouble with your mom. But the bottom line is, you know, these kind of things... Not, we're not talking about a scriptural command. We need to express gratitude to one another. But folks, are you willing to allow something that is an American thing, remain an American thing? And I'm grateful. And by the way, I'm using this illustration because this has never been a problem within our church that's ever come to my attention, I should say. Nobody's ever come to me and say, said, you know, Sada never wrote me a thank you note. I'm offended at her. And I would challenge you. I think it's because, you know, most of us know that. Once Ma Ajwa said that, Portia confirmed it again. I think most of us are like, fine. You know, that, 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 they don't need to, that is not an issue that I'm going to make anything of because I love these people. They didn't grow up. They, you know, I still have, and my mom's still with me, but I still hear her, you know. And now, of course, I have my wife who also is on top of it, like, you need to write your thank you notes. And so I, I'm willing to submit to that. You'll get a thank you note from me. But do you understand this idea that there's diversity here? And let's never make something like thank you notes become an issue. Because it shouldn't, right? And there's so many other things. I just, that was an example that came to my head. And, um... There are so many other things that you and I have to, we have to respect one another and we have to give the same care one to another. I'm going to share some personal things next week as far as I mentioned to you that for years there was a, a character trait that I had memorized and it kind of became a, a guiding uh, rule in my ministry as far as giving myself to others, that I've had to step back and say, whoa, wait a minute. And it has to do with this idea of the same care one for another. Because there's, there's many things in scriptures which people will use only to get someone else. Like, for example, the, you know the idea about going the extra mile? You know, if somebody, this was, again, you have to understand the Roman challenge here and the, that if... In the Roman day, their roads were very big. They were very proud of their roads. They had really well-maintained roads, and they were the ones that started the mile marker. And so there was a Roman law that set, compelled any citizen, if a soldier ex asked you to carry their pack, their military equipment, you were obligated by law to carry it for a mile, a Roman mile. And Jesus comes along and says, if somebody compels you to go a mile, Go two miles. And that, but here's the point. That was a challenge for you and me when it comes to serving others. But it is not a tool for us to manipulate others. And in all these rules and all these challenges in Scripture, it's very easy to use the Scriptures to weaponize the Scriptures. Oh, I, you know, Jesus said, 
If someone compels you to go a mile, you're supposed to go two, and you're not willing to go two with me? Can you see how someone would do that? Well, you know what? The same is true about this same care one for another. There are times when people will say, well, no, I, I, I want more of your attention. And I've tried. I remember one person wanted my time, and, and I wanted to be available to this person. And I would get, I remember one time looking down, there were 23 texts. In like an hour's time. I'm like, I don't have time to go back to this. You know, and, and there's only so much you can do. But then it's very easy for selfish people to not understand and use this. Weaponize this text. You know, well, why isn't everybody caring for me? And folks, that's not the, that's not the goal of this. The goal of this is so that all of us have... The mutual care, one for another. I'm going to close with this verse here. And we'll pick up with this next week. Kind of segues into what we're going to talk about. There's other verses where Paul uses the idea of the human body to communicate the church. And one of those verses is in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. He starts talking about the ministries of the church. He gave some apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then in, in, in a verse 16 of that text, in other words, he's saying, here's the purpose of the church. The church is to train God's people so they can all do the work of the ministry, and then the body of Christ is edified. And when that happens, verse 16 takes place. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part. This is a wordy verse. Maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. It's a picture of a body and how all our joints and all of our you know lig ligaments and all that, it's all meshed together. Every part is important in order for the body to fitly join together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. That's a picture of a church where everybody's pitching in. Everybody's sacrificing. Everybody's doing their parts. Because nobody is viewed as inferior or as not important. And, and that's a healthy church. And our goal, folks, as we move into this next year, and we're good, well into it, is that we want to operate in such a way that every person's talents and abilities and energy is being used for the benefit of the whole, but not in a legislated way. That's what the government wants to do. You know, They want to legislate fairness and tell you what you do with your goodies. No, that's not it. The challenge is we have the freedom, and if we are all voluntarily viewing one another as equal, and we're all, in fact, I'll pick, I'll pick up on this term because I'm way out of time. You knew that. Here's the key. You've heard that there's a phrase that's bandied about. It's not in the Bible, but man, it is in the Bible. Team, he's a team player. Did you ever hear that? That's exactly what Paul's talking about. He's a team player. He's part of the body. And he sees himself as part of the body. It's not just all about him. And that is critical when it comes to the church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, as we, as we wrestle through these things. and We talk about the church and talk about ministry. And we want to be effective. We want to honor you. And Father, I pray that you would help us. Help us to have the right mentality. Help us to view one another properly. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would glorify you. Thank you for the love that is in this church. Help us again to be a healthy body uh, so that every joint is fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. We pray that would be true of our church and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Take out your hymn books, please. And we will close in song. Let's turn to hymn number 40. And... Uh, many of you will recognize the tune. The tune is the same as for Breathe on Me, Breath of God, um, but they have a different set of words.
for it. So, uh, hymn number 40, Jesus, our Lord and King. Jesus, our Lord and King, to you our praises rise, to you our bodies we present, a living sacrifice, now justified by grace, and made alive to God, formed for yourself to show your praise, we sound your love abroad. As dead indeed to sin, we rise to walk anew, Forth as not our own but yours, we follow only you. Baptized into your death, with you again we rise to newness of a life of faith. dismissed.